Well, thank you for uh, coming out. I hope I don't disturb too many people in the periphery. But uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, as uh, Wendy said, uh, hybridity in Chinese-Canadian poetry, primarily. Um, the title of the talk is, I think, uh, Standing in the Doorway? Okay. And um, I, hope that'll become, I hope that'll become clear as I go along. Um, tell you a little bit about myself and uh, why I look so Chinese. Um, and uh, which is basically <laughs> why I want to talk about hybridity. Uh, I'm, more, I'm more Swedish than I am Chinese. Um, my Chinese grandfather uh, came over from southeastern China in 1892 and like many other Chinamen here, worked on the railroads, worked in restaurants, uh, Gambled a lot, uh, the horse track, horse race tra race track at Hastings, and uh, so forth, and ended up on the prairies, and um, getting involved in the in the restaurant business around Swift Current, Saskatchewan, Medicine Hat, and so forth. Ended up marrying the uh, cashier in his cafe, an English woman, and. Um, because he wasn't allowed to bring his, or couldn't bring his Chinese wife and children over in uh, 1902. The head tax had been just, just been raised to, I think, $500. Uh, it was just too much. He couldn't do it. Um, so he ended up spending many, many years sending money back to his wife in China and uh, raising a... a a mixed blood uh, family in Swift Current. Had uh, seven children, uh, all half Chinese, half Scots Irish, uh, all working in one of the 13 cafes in Swift Current, Saskatchewan, at that in the early part of the last century. But he also sent, rather, not just sending money back to China, he sent back. Uh, my father, at, when he was four years old, and uh, one of my aunts, who was nine years old, to kind of look after my father. And so my father was raised in China by the Chinese wife, and uh, then brought back to Canada in, when he was about 22 years old, uh, into the 30s. Um, for a variety of reasons. The Japanese uh, were getting a little close. Uh, uh, opium was getting a little too attractive, uh, and so forth. So my father ended up in the cafe business as well and um, married a Swedish girl, my mother, in Swift Current. And uh, they had uh, three children, and I'm one of them. I grew up in, uh, after the Depression, after the, after the dirty 30s, uh, and after the war, our family moved out to British Columbia to Trail, BC, in the, just after the war, and then finally to Nelson, to BC, in 48. And I basically grew up in Trail and Nelson. Uh, came to UBC um, in the late 50s, and on and on and on. Uh, started writing in the early 60s and uh, writing at a time when the whole question of race and ethnicity wasn't really, uh, one couldn't really address it. There was no language around. There was, um, um, I mean, we call each other names. We grew up calling each other, you know, Spicks, Wops, Dukes, Chinks, so forth in a small town. I grew up in a very small town, 10,000 people. Uh, once again, in the cafe business, my father's cafe. And um, for the first 20 years of my writing life during the 60s and 70s, there was really no way to 
to, to talk about. No, re no way for me, at least, to uh, kind of even think about my whatever identity might be. And of course, identity at that time, really, identity politics wasn't uh, wasn't around. You couldn't. Uh, there was just no way to discuss it. So. Um, What happened was, and I'm just going just to read here from, uh, I'm going to start reading and, and moving in and out of texts. But here's a piece from this book, Diamond Grill, which I'm going to read from later, but uh, it's about my grandfather. He wouldn't go back again with no chance and all that old stuff, China. As far as Grandpa Wa was concerned, his wife and her family could have whatever money he still had left, that and the small chunk of land that he had bought and paid for. Let them farm it forever. He wasn't interested in that kind of life. Or, he told her, she could go with him if she wanted to, though he knew, though he knew they probably wouldn't let her in anyway. She'd never leave Kaiping and her family, especially now she'd become a landowner. But they would be okay. He would send money back when he struck it big again. He returned to Canada in 1904, for about four, after four years back in China, enough time to get a wife and have three children. He had used up all the money he had made in Canada, so he wanted to get back there and try his luck again. He told his wife that, he's, that he was going to the Philippines, but he knew there were better chances in Canada. The head tax had been raised twice since he left, and he thought if he didn't get back to Canada soon, it might be too expensive for him. First he came to Vancouver, but they had lots of laws there against Chinamen, so he couldn't get much work. Since he didn't have a bunch of money to play the horses like the last time, he drifted out to the prairies, to Moose Jaw. He knew Henry Chow was there in a ch partnership in a restaurant with three other guys. Henry told him that no one wanted to sell out right away, so he should wait a while. He washed dishes for $20 a month, 14 to 16 hours a day. Every night he had to wash the floor in the kitchen by using a potato sack under his knees and brushes in his hands. At harvest time, he got a job cooking on the CPR line that went all the way to Prince Albert. He'd work two days straight with one day off, and they paid him $40 a month. But in winter, he went back to Moose Jaw and worked in the restaurant. All the partners and seven or eight other guys stayed there. It was warm and there was no work anywhere, so they all looked after the cafe. One day, Henry told him about a fellow in Swift Current who wanted to sell his share in the cafe. So he went down there to see about it. This guy was going back to China to get, to get married, so he was selling. Li Lung was the only other partner, and Grandpa knew one of Li's uncles in the village next to his back in China. He had been lucky in gambling lately, so he had $500 to put in. A few shares in a couple of cafes, he thought, and he could start to take it easy, let his money do the work. The Venice Cafe worked out well. They made good profits because there were only two of them. So in 1906, he sold out some of his share to a few of Lee Lung's relatives and became a silent partner. He bought a working share in the Regal Cafe, and by then his English was better, so he worked up front, which was easier than the kitchen. He got to know a lot of the white guys, and once in a while he'd play cards with them. Except for a brief venture in Medicine Hat, in 1912 he stayed in Swift Current. The Regal was really his main cafe for a long time, right into the 30s. But early on, that's where he met his white wife, Florence. And I just wanted to mention that, that try to set up that uh, sense of Chinese in Western Canada in the early part of last century, where they were limited to either laundromats or cafes. So two, that's about all they could get into. And a lot of the Chinamen, um, formed partners, partnerships in cafes. There might be you know, up to a dozen different partners in a cafe uh, trying to make it work. And they, would, they were really thrifty. They sent money back home. They would uh, make it out and make, you know, just kind of move it along. So at one point, I know my grandfather in Swift Current was involved in seven different cafes as part, you know, part, silent partners, and he worked in one of them. And uh, my dad and my uncles also started into that kind of game. Um, and if you talk to any cafe owner in Western Canada, you're going to, and look into that history, you'll find that there were partners <laughs> all along. And they were usually partners from the same village or a nearby village uh, in, in, from China. They were 
they all knew one another. They were uh, from the same part of China. By the 1970s, Pierre Trudeau had uh, brought on to brought it brought the whole notion of uh, first of all bilingualism and biculturalism in the late 60s, and uh, and then in the early 70s he started talking about this thing called multiculturalism, and this was something that Canada hadn't really got its head around or you know didn't quite know how to handle uh, all the different <laughs> people in this country. And um, so the 70s were really quite an interesting turn for the whole question of race and ethnicity in this country. Uh, in my memory, it, for in terms of the, you know, the literary world, it was really Obasan, Joy Kagawa's book Obasan, that was a big kind of turnaround. Here, all of a sudden, was a novel about the Chinese intern the Japanese internment uh, during the Second World War that was uh, really a well-written novel and very popular. It made it, made it, uh, it really did very well. So all of a sudden, there was this kind of, uh, in English departments and in literature courses, people started talking about race and started thinking about Japanese-Canadian internment. Um, in the late 1970s, uh, the Japanese-Canadian redress movement started picking up. And there was a committee established of, uh, of JCs, uh, mostly in Western Canada. And they started pressuring the government to, uh, to compensate the Japanese for the property they had uh, taken out from under them. Uh, asked for an apology. You know, there's been lots of stuff going on on the radio lately about apologies. So we can put that in there. But all of a sudden, the whole question of race became to be, to be able to discuss it became possible. And uh, that was really a surprise to a kind of a surprise to me. I, by that time, I, you know, I was uh, I was almost uh, um, 40 years old and had been through a kind of uh, uh, fairly white poetry writing life. That was the community I was involved in. And the, those were the people, you know, they were good friends and they were really uh, interesting people, mostly configured around the notion of class, working class people that I uh, hung out with at UBC. And um, so class, race, uh, ethnicity, all of those things start to interplay and, and, and juxtapose quite a bit. Um, there was in Vancouver, quite a, during the 80s, now moving into the 80s, there started to become an awful lot of activity. I think, um, is Jim Wong Chu here tonight? Did he come with? I'm not sure. Anyway, Jim Wong Chu is a kind of uh, major uh, player in the, uh, well, he started the, the, I think it was called the Chinese Canadian Writers Workshop back in the 70s. It became the Asian Canadian later on. It started out just um, Pender Guy and down in Chinatown with uh, Sid Tan and uh, a few other people. Um, anyway, that started to pick up. That started to pick up steam. Um, I guess I'd better move on to some pictures here. Let's see what we've got. Well, that was the first cafe, the New Star Cafe in Nelson that my dad got into. Um, fairly typical uh, 1950s cafe with a kind of modern oval window. Um, in 1990, uh, Sharon Lee, Sky Lee, published a novel called Disappearing Moon Cafe. Um, that also was a quite, quite a a kind of major thrust into, for at least uh, the Chinese Canadian people, the Asian Canadian people I was hanging around with by 1990 because we were looking for a discourse. We were looking for a language that we could use to uh, try to address this sense of, um, of being racialized. And we had been racialized all our lives. We just had never really found any way to uh, to talk about it. 
And we formed uh, alliances uh, with uh, a number of uh, First Nations groups, a number of uh, even Ukrainian groups in Edmonton, and people who were interested in how, to, how do you talk about who you are in terms of race and ethnicity. For me, particularly for those of us who really look so Chinese, <laughs> um, the whole question of mixed identity Started, started to come up in the 90s. Um, in 1991, uh, Jim Wong Chu and Bennett Lee edited a, a, the first anthology of, uh, of writing by, Ch uh, uh, contemporary writing by Chinese Canadians. And I just want to read you uh, a kind of comment on that, which I think is quite, quite useful. This is from a book called Writing in Our Time, and this is uh, a little section uh, by Pauline Butling. The first major anthology of Chinese Canadian writing to, pu to be published in Canada, edited by two members of that community, appeared in 1991. The process had, that preceded its publication demonstrates the effectiveness of one set of discursive terms. Those, those associated with identity narratives as an activist tool. The process began in the mid-1980s when a mainstream white editor received preliminary funding from the Secre Secretary of State for Multiculturalism to edit and publish an anthology of Chinese-Canadian poetry and fiction. When the editor approached the Chinese-Canadian community, however, as However, as poet activist Jim Wong Chu explains, he met considerable resistance from that community at a community that was distrustful and militant about having outsiders control the product which is so important to represent the community. That community had already been politicized through forming the Chinese Canadian Writers Workshop more than a decade earlier, later named the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop. So they already understood the importance of self-representation in asserting their identity as a legitimate group within the dominant literary culture. Now they took control of the production. Bennett Lee and Jim Wong Chu took over as editors and also chose the publisher. This was, that was a really <laughs> major uh, twist to have, uh, I won't mention who the white editor was, but he was, and he was, a, he was certainly friends with uh, a lot of us and, and, a, and a pretty good guy. But uh, it was that typical thing of let's get a white editor to put together this anthology of difference. And uh, luckily, uh, people like Jim Wong Chu and a number of others uh, resisted that and sort of took over. And that whole, the whole notion, I'm talking pretty much in a literary context here. I can't talk about necessarily a social or an economic one. But in a literary context, the notion of taking control of your own production became... Had always been, it had always been important for little magazines and small publishers uh, and so forth. But now we adopted that same uh, dynamic or that same method in working around Chinese Canadian writing. The discursive terms that came to the fore in the process of producing this anthology highlight the politics of representation. For the Chinese Canadian community, it was crucial that instead of gaining visibility, both discursively and materially, by a dispensation from the dominant group, the hallmark of the imperialist model, they had to achieve it by their own agency and on their terms. As many a colonized or excluded group has discovered, taking control of their representations is vital to community empowerment and identity formation. The anthology intervenes overtly in the social order as much as in the literary field in that it presents new subjects as well as new writing. In other words, the new writing brought along new subjects, new people who were very present uh, to all of this. Um, so there, a few years after uh, this anthology was published, uh, we had a, a, a kind of major conference in Canada called Writing Through Race. Uh, 
sort of came through the Writers' Union and it was created a kind of a bit of a furor in 1994 that we could uh, have a conference that was limited to people of race. <laughs> uh, certainly uh, a lot of the mainstream white writers uh, resisted that and didn't like it. But we had that conference here in Vancouver and it was uh, highly successful and uh, a number of a number of people have gone on out of that kind of situation. Uh, Sonny Choi, some of you know Wayson Choi's work, uh, is uh, a kind of very popular mainstream, but many other writers as well came out of, came out of that context. Sorry. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to move along more quickly here. Um, I wanted to look at uh, three contemporary poets and... Um, I want to look first at Wayman, a poem by Wayman Chan. I'm just going to, I don't know if, you probably can't read that, but um, Wayman Chan's a young poet from Calgary. Uh, he was in one of my classes in creative writing and, uh, when I taught at, at the University of Calgary. And he's gone on to publish a number of uh, really fine poetry books. Um, anyway, this is, uh, this is from, uh, um, what's the name of that? Noise from the Laundry. Um, Uncle Dong Fei is 104, fragile in winter. He has it standing still, those shakes in his bleached, red gnarled, soaked to the bone son of a laundryman's hands. A committed Christian whose YMC-sponsored wife back in 1920 was the talk of Chinatown. And I ask him how old he is, really, and he just laughs, waters the African violets in his room and lets me feed him congee with ungu and muk ni. My father brings him a plastic cream cheese container full of tofu jello, homemade afufa. Mmm, hakek, can't eat so much, Uncle Dong Fei protests waving those thickened calluses and bleached nails. He still starches his own collars, irons, and presses his six shirts and four pants on visiting days when we can watch him. His eyes brighten when the nurse brings in the iron and ironing board. Look, listen, and learn, my father seems to indicate by the way he leans forward. Uncle Dong Fei takes a giant gulp of peppermint water, and spews the finest mist cloud from his lips. A rainbow leaps up and leaves its arc. He begins ironing as, he, as the droplets fall on his sleeve, his chest pockets, the detail around each cuff button. His early shakes are stilled and purposeful. The hot iron's prow glides over a white sea looking for refuge, unwrinkling vastness as it goes along. And his ship never stops curving in spite of itself. And I think of rescue within rescue, because there must be a point to this. And Uncle Dong Fei, Uncle Dong Fei, who just keeps going. And it's a kind of a, I hate to say typical, there's quite a range of, of, of uh, writing by people like Wayman. But some of the things that come up in here that are very typical of, I think, many of at least my generations and Wayman's, uh, Wayman's generation's concerns are, the whole sense of, uh, of family, of ancestry, grandfather, father, um, um, this, and, and then this, always finding oneself sort of inserted in between. One's in the, gen I'm kind of between generations, or probably you people are more in between than I am, but that sense of being in between your, 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 your fa in your family and that sense of, uh, of going forward. And other little things like uh, this whole, you know, the whole notion of, uh, of the, the hot iron's prow glides over a white sea, that little pun on white, the white of the shirt, the white of <laughs> this white world <laughs> that uh, he's cruised into. Um, so that immigration, how, how a person got here, uh, most of the most of these poems that I'm going to sh show you here are involve um, water. <laughs> um, oh, what's that doing there? Sorry. 
Oh, yeah, I actually wanted to mention this whole notion of, of history um, here. Because this, and so history is all around these, these pieces. Uh, but history in a very, and I haven't seen really anyone take this on very accurately or closely yet. Here's a, a collage by Roy Meeke, um, a, a, a J.C. writer, poet, who uh, about the same age as me. <laughs> Um, and and Roy's, Roy taught at Simon Fraser. He's retired a number of years ago. And he got involved in just using Photoshop and collaging. And, and he's done a lot of really interesting stuff. But I was talking to him about this particular collage. And what we ended up talking about was, and it's a collage in which there's his family uh, standing in St. Agath, uh, uh, Manitoba, where they were interned on a sugar beet farm uh, during the war. And then the clouds and kind of looking from down from the clouds and looking over, over the clouds are these, this younger generation. And there's one of his relatives, obviously with a white guy. Uh, so the mix continues. And they're looking down on this old photo. And Roy and I were talking about this notion of remembering the future and how history really is a place where one can engage that sense of remembering the future, whatever that might mean. But it certainly means something when you think of that poem by Wayman Chan, Uncle Dong Fei just keeps going. Something just keeps going. And, um, you know, you do, will our ancestors remember us? <laughs> I mean, there's... The whole notion of time and periodicity here. Anyway, I wanted to show you that beautiful uh, collage by Roy. And I'm just going to use a, a piece or two from uh, Larissa Lai's uh, book of poems, the Tomaton Biographies. And uh, Larissa has, well, it's a whole bunch of stuff goes on in this book. I see some of you smile. You must know the book. It's a kind of uh, wacko. Uh, all over the place book, but she really does do. She did really does kind of get into some of her own bio text, if you like. Um, so here's this piece, uh, Sapyut, um, eleven, right? Counting in Chinese. Grandfather Mark's decision, cross Chinese line to freedom, a journey begins. Natural feet, but no education. Great-grandmother runs easily, bound feet and reading knowledge. Great-great-aunt must be carried, but her three kingdoms ease our weary minds. One war escapes another, by train, by bus, desperate scramble in heat fear. The push and shove of crowd, survival, stirs rising temperatures. How petty wearies on history's backdrop. Chun King shimmers unreachable. You can still live in an occupied city. Ye Ye sells dried goods in Guangzhou, Lin Chi and, and beans. We hide, eat makesh makeshift meager, say her stories, soothe ancestral time. So that kind of still addressing basically the same thing, the context of history in one's family, the, the whole sense of crossing, uh, cross Chinese line to freedom, the... the uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure specifically what Larissa is referring to there. It might be the Japan, her family escaping the Japanese invasion or, uh, uh, or whatever. Um, the push and shove of crowd survival is, harkens back to that notion of Wayman's of rescue within rescue. How do you recuperate? How do you, how do you, you know, keep this going? Um, just going to move along a little more quickly here. Um, ye sup ye. 22. Uh, neither red nor dead, Sun Yat Sen precedes General Chang, precedes the gentle chairman not yet tainted by a thousand flowers, great leap backwards, glass kneeling sessions of cultural devolution, Neither reformed or, nor deformed, Chinese characteristics open to hog market economy. Dish canto pop to race the pace of labor, 
in airless factory rooms. Monumentalized, gorgeous displacement, harness Yangtze River to show America the brilliant lights of Shanghai. What we do to our rivers, we can do to your debt. Forget the pain in my golden lotus feet. Forget the unfinished escape. Great, great aunt ghosts, like Dong Zhu, who killed a village of his own civilians, paraded their heads through Chang'an to pretend success in battle. Lin Qi softened slowly in mouth. So here she's you know, nicely flipped around the genders. Her, it's her aunt, not her uncle or not her grandfather. So she, she's kind of inserting that. But it's still this, and it's still this mixed discourse, you know, golden lotus feet, and, uh, and uh, then the history of, of, of war in, in China and, and the uh, great leap backwards here. Um, this notion of history as a way of remembering the future is bec starts to become, for people like Larissa Lai and Rita Wong, and uh, I think um, perhaps some of you, uh, a way of grabbing hold of a way to go on. <laughs> In other words, it's, I know that's a, that the, the metaphysics of, of uh, past and future and of memory, which we're not going to get into <laughs> right now, but uh, it's all rife with this notion of, of um, remembering the future. Complex thing. Okay, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to just do a piece by Rita now. I'm going to do a couple, but uh, this is a piece um, from Rita's book *Monkey Puzzle* that uh, I've always, you know, it's just can you see, yeah. I don't know what the characters. Reed, do you know Glenn? It's asking, are you hungry? Right. And she plays around with that in here. It's the, it's the way to say, you know, how, ch hello, right? Uh, but uh, not, it's not, are you hungry? It's, have you eaten? <laughs> right? um, and she plays around with that. But the poem, the shape of the poem on the page, I think is really interesting, um, at least the way I read it. And there, there certainly might be other ways to read this. But uh, right around the absence, she said, show its existent, existence. Demonstrate its contours, how it tastes, where its edges fall hard on my stuttering tongue, how its tones and pro pictograms get flattened out by the steamroller of an English language. Its etymology of assimilation tramples budding memory into sawdusty stereotypes, regimented capitals, arrogant nouns and more nouns, punctuated by subservient descriptors. Grammar is the dust on the streets waiting to be washed off by immigrant cleaners or blown into your eyes by the wind. Grammar is the invisible net in the air holding your words in place. Grammar, like wealth, belongs in the hands of the people who produce it. And then these other two clumps there. This is the sound of my Chinese tongue whispering, Neitu, Nama. No tones can survive this alphabet. Live, half submerged in the salty home of my mother tongue, shallows. So this. It's kind of crossing over. The language crosses. The languages cross over. The English crosses over from the left margin into over to the right, mm -hmm. takes over, <laughs> um, steamrollers the whole thing, and hanging around on either side of this so the, is, is her mother tongue. So, but it posits the poem posits this notion of. Um, taking over of wealth belongs in the hands of the people who produce it. Simple, simple thing. So once again, it's that recognition of, uh, of taking control of one's production. 
Okay, I'm going to, do you, have, do you want to ask any questions? I'm going to go on with Diamond Grill, if uh, that's the way I'd planned to do. That's my only shtick. It's <laughs> uh, okay, I'll just, I'll go on with, uh, uh, I just, I don't know if, can I go back here? Oh, yeah, I put that in. Uh, I wrote a book called Faking It, and, and basically from La it's like Larissa has in the previous poem I didn't do. She talks about faking it as making it. You must make this up. You know, you must make this up. You must make this up. You must make up your own story. You must. Or it's somebody else. It's somebody else's. But I wanted to... Oh, there, Yeah. This is the cover of, uh, of the first edition of Diamond Grill, and it's, um, uh, it was after, after I'd written the book, the publishers were looking for a, a cover, and I was, uh, I'd been going through my mother's, you know, in, in our family we had a kind of stool that had a, a lid on it. You lift it up, and inside, under the sort of stool, was tons of stuff that you know, just, she kept shoving in there. And this was where she threw out a lot of old photos should just never look at them. And I went through it one day and I found this photo and it was a triplic triple exposure of uh, my grandfather uh, with a hat on back there and me on a swing with, and then my father. So, and I thought, well, that sure, that sure fits. And, I, and I've, I've always loved that photo of a kind of notion of, uh, once again, family, once again, and generations and ancestors. So let's just move on here. So Oops, I think that's about it. Okay. Um, I'm going to read from my, no my book, Knowledge. I just about called it a novel. <laughs> um, this, it opens with this little piece from an earlier book called Waiting for Saskatchewan. Uh, Diamond Grill, Waiting for Saskatchewan, and another book called Breathing My Name of the Sci are really all connected. They're all the same text as far as I'm concerned. And each of the three books is kind of another attempt to kind of break through uh, the problem of how to articulate uh, racialization. And it started in the late 70s with that book, Breathe in My Name with a Sigh, which was simply uh, um, this kind of thing. My father hurting at the table, sitting, hurting at supper time, deep inside, very far down inside, because I can't stand the ginger in the beef and greens he cooked for us tonight. And years later tonight, that look on his face appears now on mine, my children, my food, their food, my father, their father, me, mine, the father, very far, very, very far inside. It was a way to, it's a father thing. You know, it's my father had died 15 years earlier and I'd never really come to grips with it and that was one way to, uh, to get at it. So I started writing out my, if you like, my grief for my father uh, leaving so soon. And um, in do, doing so, had to address the fact that he was Chinese. He was very, and had to address all of our family history of growing up as growing up Chinese in Nelson because, you know, your father runs the restaurant, you're a chink, right? No, that's what the, you know, that's no question about who I, my identity in terms of the other kids in town. Uh, and that was okay, that worked out. We never just really t kind of talked about it. But um, one of the things and why this is called standing in the doorway is the book opens with this piece. Um, in the diamond at the end of a long green vinyl aisle between booths of chrome, naugahyde, and formica, 
are two large swinging wooden doors, each with a round hatch of face-sized window. Those kitchen doors can be kicked with such a slap they're heard all the way up to the soda fountain. On the other side of the doors, hardly audible to the customers, echoes a jargon of curses, jokes, and cryptic orders. Stack of hots, half a dozen fry, hot beef sand. Fingers and tongues all over the place jibe and swear. You mock a high, lung you. And outside, running through and around the town, the creeks flow down to the lake with maybe a spring thaw. And the prairie sun over the mountains to the east, over my family's shoulders. The journal journey tilts tight-fisted through the gutter of the book, avoiding a place to start or end. Maps don't have beginnings, just edges. Some frayed and hazy margin of possibility, absence, gap. Shouts in the kitchen, fish an, side of fries, over easy, on brown. I pick up an order and turn back through the doors, whap. My foot registers more than its own imprint, starts to read the stain of memory. Thus, a kind of heterocellular recovery reverberates through the busy body, from the foot against that kitchen door, on up the leg into the torso and hands, eyes thinking straight ahead, looking through doors and languages, skin recalling its own reconnaissance, cooked into the steamy food, replayed in the folds of elsewhere, always far away, tunneling through the center of the earth, mouth saying can't forget, mouth saying what I want to know can feed me, what I don't can bleed me. So that door, the doors in our cafe and in many cafes at that, from that era were, there were two doors, one for going into the kitchen, one for coming out of the kitchen. Don't get them wrong. <laughs> and uh, there's always a, a little hatch of glass there so you could look through and see, make sure you, do, you weren't getting it wrong. But they were really well-built doors and there was a beautiful bra blast, brass plate along the bottom of the door and I loved kicking that door when I worked for my dad's, in my dad's cafe. Uh, boy, kicking that door as you walked out of the kitchen with a full arms full of food, wapo! It felt really so good. But uh, the door becomes in the book uh, and uh, in my whole kind of um, uh, writing around hybridity, uh, the door becomes a metaphor for, um, a metaphor for hybridity. It's how the door operates. So I've even, even published a book called Isidore <laughs> just a, a while ago. I'm really hooked on doors, but uh, the door, the whole question of standing in the doorway is, um, if you like, a strategy of hybridity that I believe I have to uh, get hold of. If I stand in the doorway, don't go through, I can see both rooms. Great advantage just standing in the doorway. You know? I know you stop a lot of other people coming through, but <laughs> uh, so there's a little bit of a ruckus going on. But um, that being in between, just standing in the doorway, being in between, is exactly what I think I need to look at. Because the problem with being mixed with being a hybrid is that there's always this push to be one or the other. It's that, that hyphen, at least for me, in my experience, has always, you know, are you, is it Chinese or Canadian? Is it, or is it, how can you, how does that hyphen ameliorate that identity in some way? And uh, I'm neither Chinese nor Canadian. I admit it. I didn't choose to be Canadian. None of us choose <laughs> that kind of national uh, identity frequently. Um, certainly didn't choose my race. None of us do. Um, so locating a place of agency, if you like, for hybridity, for mixed race people, is uh, problematic, exciting. Uh, generative, it's, uh, it provides, it's a, it's a little engine that provides a lot of us with the way to move. But to move, in, I think, to move intelligently in that, in that place is, uh, is important.
Um, how long, Wendy, how long do you, you want me to? Oh, okay. Got lots of time. <laughs> it's longer than a university class. Chinese sausage. When I'm in Chinatown, I see it hanging in the butcher windows in bundles, call, candled together with twine. My mouth waters at the sight of the dried sausages marbled with fat. I still call Chinese sausage Fung Cheng. That's what my Granny Wa called it. And Granny cooked Fung Cheng nearly all the time, a real delicacy. We'd have family meals in her and Grandpa's little house, and there was usually a large group of people at the table, uncles and aunts and cousins. I'd watch her at the stove when she opened up the rice pot, peek at the glistening steamed sausages so red and juicy on top of the white rice. She cooked one Fung Chang for each person. Everybody got served one sausage on top of their rice, and so did I. But I always had one underneath, too. <laughs> Granny put an extra one under my rice for me, special. So the book's full of uh, a lot of... Um, food, because uh, that's, what, that's what race was to me. Uh, my father, because he grew up in China uh, as a kind of half ghost, uh, nonetheless could speak better Chinese than most of the <laughs> Chinamen who had stayed in Canada, and he could cook. He was a great Chinese cook, but he had to have rice. So he did most of the cooking at home. It took years for my mother to learn how to cook a pot or, good pot of rice. But, um, so food became central. And I think it's probably central for most families somehow. Food, you know, it's, it's like home cooking, etc. cetera. Um, just, I'm just picking out a few pieces here that address some of these issues. Um, this is my grandmother. My white grandmother. His, or his mother's family are stern and religious Scots-Irish, railroad people from Ontario. His in-laws, when he marries Corrine Erickson in 1938, are post-World War I economic refugees from Sweden. While he and Ethel have been in China, their brothers and sisters have negotiated particular identities for themselves through the, through, through the familiarity of a white European small prairie town commonality albeit colonial democracy. Though he arrives back to everyone struggling through the 30s, they all have their place. They're part of the reputed latest Pleistocene migration staged to the middle of Canada. And they are then him and then his and her and then me and so on, given the impediment, authority, and above all, the possibility of place. He thinks, after he and Ethel's intimidation as half-ghosts in China, that this petri dish of hope and plenty is a great opportunity through which and with which he and his kind can go on away from, hopefully, the fragmented diaspora, but always with some tag of chance that will continually fire a brand spanking new trajectory into what has been, after all, an unrelentingly foreign world. Hybridize or disappear, family in place. And it's that not so much, uh, you know, adopt, <laughs> but uh, the call to uh, uh, do it correctly. <laughs> I mean, in, in other words, for a hybrid to hybrid, it has to hybridize. And that's, oops, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I loved growing up in Western Canada and... Uh, Still, still, when I go into a small town, you know, drive through, say, Golden or Revelstoke or uh, places like that, I, I kind of look for the names of the Chinese cafes. Um, I think Jim, Jim Long Chu told me there was one Elite cafe that he knew of, and it was in uh, somewhere in the Okanagan. He has it, sent me a picture of it. Anyway. Famous Chinese restaurant is the name of a small strip mall Chinese cafe a friend of mine eats at once in a while. We laugh at the innocent pretentiousness of the name famous. <coughs> but then I think of the pride with which my father names Diamond Grill. 
For him, the name is neither innocent nor pretentious. The diamond he proudly regales the banquet at the grand opening is the most modern, up-to-date restaurant in the interior of B.C. The angled design of the booths matches the angles of a diamond, and the diamond itself stands for good luck. We hope this new restaurant will bring good luck for all our families and for this town. Eat, drink, have a good time. Almost everything in Chinese stands for good luck, it seems. You're not supposed to use words that might bring bad luck. Andy Ethel is very upset when we choose a white casket for my father's funeral. She says, that no good. White mean death, bad luck. So I understand something of the dynamics of naming and desire when I think of the names of some Chinese cafes in my family's history. The big one, of course, is the Elite, which we, with no disregard for the Queen's, disrespect for the Queen's English, always pronounce the Elite. In fact, everyone in town pronounces that way. My dad works in an Elite in Swift Current, and that's what he names his cafe and trail when he moved out to BC. Elite is a fairly common Chinese cafe name in the early 50s but not anymore. I still see one in Edmonton, on Edmonton Trail in Calgary, and I know one of one in Revelstoke. I like the re resonant undertone in the word elite, the privilege to choose. In the face of being denied the right to vote up until 1949, I smile a little at the recognition by the Chinese that choice is indeed a privilege. Other names also play on the margins of fantasy and longing. Grandpa Wa owns the Regal and Swift Current, and just around the corner are the Venice and the Paris. Just as Chang escapes to Taiwan, my father gets into the New Star in Nelson. During the 50s and 60s, coincidental with the rise of Canadian nationalism, we find small town cafe, cafes with names like The Canadian, Canada Chinese, Takeout, and, and in respect of Hockey Night in Canada, The All Star. Along the border, American Canadian Cafe and The Ambassador. One could read more recent trends such as Bamboo Terrace, which is really not <laughs> no longer a new trend, <laughs> Heaven's Gate, Pearl Seafood Restaurant, and the Mandarin as indicative of both the recognized exoticization in, in Orientalism, as well as possibly a slight turn, a deference, pride, and longing for the homeland. Perhaps we might regard more concretely what resonates for us when we walk into places like White Dove Cafe and Hotel in Moss Bank, Saskatchewan, or the even now famous Disappearing Moon Cafe, 50 East Pender, Vancouver, BC. Better watch out for the craw, better watch out for the goat. That's the mix, the breed, the half-breed, Métis, quarter-breed, trace of a breed, true, demi, semi, ethnic, polluted, rootness, living technicolor snarl to complicate the underbelly panavision of racism and bigotry across this country. I know you're going to say that's just being Canadian. The only people who call themselves Canadian live in Ontario and have national C to shining C 2020 CPR vision. When I was in elementary school, we had to fill out a form at the beginning of each year. The first couple of years, I was really confused. The problem was the blank after racial origin. I thought, well, this is Canada. I'll put down Canadian. But the teacher said, no, Freddie, you're Chinese. Your racial origin is Chinese. That's what your father is. Canadian isn't a racial identity. That's turned out to be true, but I'm not really Chinese either, nor were some of the other kids in my class real Italian, Dukabor, or British. Quite a soup, Heinz 57 varieties. There's a whole bunch of us who've grown up as resident aliens living in the hyphen. Like the Chinese kids who came over after 1949 couldn't take me into their confidence. I always ended up playing on the other team against them because they were foreign and I was white enough to be on the winning team. When I visited China and I told the guide of our tour group that I was Chinese, he just laughed at me. I don't blame him. He, for all his racial purity, so characteristic of mainland Chinese, was much happier thinking of me as a Canadian, someone over there, white, Euro, but not Chinese. That could be the answer in this country. If you're pure anything, you can't be Canadian. We'll save that name for all the mixed bloods in this country, and when the cities have heritage days and ethnic festivals, there will be a group that I can identify with, the Canadians. When the government gives out money for cultural centers, we'll get ours too. 
these real Canadians could gain a legitimate marginalized position. The French Canadians would have to be Quebecois, the Mennonites, Mennonites, Brits, Brit. And if you're a Scot from Hamilton or a Jew from Winnipeg, then be that. I don't care. But stop telling me what I'm not, what I can't join, what I can't feel or understand. And don't whine to me about maintaining your ethnic ties to the old country. Don't explain the concept of time in terms of a place called Greenwich. Don't complain about not being able to find Tootsie Rolls or authentic Mexican food north of the 49th. Sometimes I'd rather be left alone. So there's a, there's a little bit of anger in the book. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's racial anger or if it's I'm just an angry person, but uh, uh, at least for me, growing up in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, <laughs> all those decades, uh, the earlier decades were particularly um, uh, were particularly problematic. Just read a couple more pieces here, and we maybe have some discussion. I'm just a baby, maybe six months. 0.5% old. One of my aunts is holding me on her knee. Sitting on the ground in front of us are her two daughters, 50% Scottish. Another aunt, the one who grew up in China with my father, sits on the step with her first two children around her. They are 75% Chinese. There is another little 75% girl cousin, the daughter of another 50% aunt, who married a 100% full-blooded Chinaman, full-blooded from China even. At the back of the black and white photograph is my oldest boy cousin. He's 25% Chinese. His mother married a Scot from North, North Battleford, and his sister mar sisters married Italians from Trail. So there, spread out on the stoop of a house in Swift Current, Saskatchewan, we have our own little Western Canadian multicultural stock exchange. We all grew up together in Swift Current, Calgary, Trail, Nelson, and Vancouver, 27% of John A's nation, and only get together now every three years, 33% for a family reunion, to which between 70 and 80% of us show up. Out of 15 cousins, only one, 6.6%, married a 100% pure Chinese. The return on these racialized investments has produced colorful dividends and yield an annual growth rate that now parallels blue chip stocks like Kodak and Fuji though current global market forces indicate that such stocks, by their volatile nature, will be highly speculative and risky. Unexpected developments like immigration acts could knock estimates for a loop. Always take future projections with either a grain of salt or, better still, a dash of soy. Um, I think I'm just going to read... Uh, Finish off with this last little thing, another foodie, and we can maybe talk a little bit. Now think hard when I read this about your family's recipe. <laughs> Juk is a soup we always have after New Year's because it's made with leftover turkey. I think of it as the bridge between our white Christmas presents and turkey stuffing, and our Chinese New Year, firecrackers and juk. As far as I know, all of the Wah families have it, and each is distinct distinctive. Auntie Ethel's is pretty good, but my mom still makes my dad's version once in a while, though neither she nor Ash Ethel add that little shot of rye whiskey he said was the secret to a really good juk. I couldn't taste liquor, but boy, his soup was the best, a real treat. But he, also, he also, but he also used the little red dates, which I'd pick aside. They're too much of a contrast, a little too sweet for the full-bodied, ricey broth. And Ethel says you don't really need them. But if you want to try them, get a package of small red pitted dates at the Chinese supermarket. Also, buy only the smallest packet of chung toy, salted turnip, since you only need a couple of pieces. For the fujuk, the dried bean curd, You'll have to decide between flat ropes or flat sheets or ropes. I prefer the ropes because they're chewier. Soak the whole package of juke overnight. Be sure to wash the chung toy. It's heavily salted, or it used to be, not anymore. Peel and slice a few freshwater chestnuts. Optional is a bit of the dark seaweed and a few soaked Chinese mushrooms. Put all this with a couple of cups of rice into the turkey stock. You should have about six to eight cups of liquid and cook slowly for an hour or so until the rice is overdone. If not very much of the turkey made it this far and you feel the need for some meat, 
you can add a bit of sliced pork steak. In the end, you should have a thick, thickish gruel, almost a congee. Juk is even better than bird's nest soup, though both soups share an intrinsic proprioceptive synapse, memory. While slurping a bowl of juk with the January snow still swirling outside, the memory of the bird itself, only a few weeks old, triangulates with a smoky star-filled night in China. Likewise, the gelatinous bird's nest soup. Likewise, with the gelatinous bird's nest soup, the taste carries images of men climbing the walls of dark ca caves in Yunnan, collecting the sp spaghetti-like translucent strands of bird's nests, the frightened cries of the swallows themselves as piercing as a foreign language. So how about I stop there and we can talk a little, if you like. Thank you. <laughs> Unless there's something that someone wants me to read from Diamond Grill, it's such an old book now, but. Glenn has a question. Again, I, I hope I don't steal the thunder from at least a dozen students from UBC who are perhaps writing theses on you. <laughs> I know a few who are actually writing, writing um, papers on you. Um, but I wanted to open up with a question about memory and, and the work of constructing and recovering these, these memories. And how, in writing this, how your own memories of these events now, which you have both constructed and reconstructed, uh, but also working with a combination of, of textual invention and in partly with, with recovery, how that begins to change the memory, or how memory itself begins to, to get fixed by, by writing, and, and then how, when, when you begin to relate this as a form, and, and even sharing it with family mem members, how, perhaps over, over time, how their memories have been jogged by some of this, within family discussions, or whether it has. So the question about that is how it's affected your, your revisiting of these memories over time. Well, I think there's a couple of things that happen when, uh, first of all, you have to make it up. Right? So I really, I really, you know, when you're writing, you have to sit there and you have to keep one word follows the next and you find you're making it up. And uh, you look at photographs, you look at family photographs or old photographs, you ask questions, you talk to cousins, you get stories, different stories. <laughs> Uh, things become uh, happily uh, kind of borderline fictional, non-fictional. You don't know what's real or what's not. But in terms of, uh, um, I mean, you, you know, you, we, we use the term, or most of us use the term memory as if we know what it is, as if memory is something kind of, Set yet it's a very um, uh, kind of an amorphous area. My mother is 96 now and has uh, 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 Alzheimer's. I guess you know sure she's lost her memory. She has no language left. Um, all she has is all she has are her eyes, and she looks at, through them and she looks right in through me, and something's going on. So I'm not sure where that, that whole sense of, I think I'm, I'm very su suspicious of constructing memory now. But at the same time, uh, I think that's part of story. I think that's part of claiming story, uh, very much uh, aligned with that sense of putting your own, ha putting your own hands in it. You know, you've got to do it. Um, and to assume that the story is something that's simply given to you is uh, too passive, I think, at least for myself as a writer. So, but I, but I do suspect this whole, <laughs> and, and enjoy the, the kind of playfulness, uh, particularly since I'm not claiming that this is true. You know, it's, it's simply an investigation and, and a play with story and language as to uh, 
how to make this true, how to make the writing true. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question or... Well, yes, I mean, it's such a, a wonderfully er uh, rich area for, for exploration, and I think it also, it, it makes me think of you know, the earlier comments that you said about how uh, you might think about the possibility of our ancestors remembering us, and that kind of puts things in paradoxical reversal, but we, we think about the possibility of ourselves being imagined in the past in a particular way. At the same time, we, we, we think about what we are leaving for the future in terms of instruments for memory, mm -hmm. a textual legacy by which they can begin to reconstruct ourselves. Um, and, and so that's, that's leaving a memory for the future. Well, I mean, the word construct is the, the, <laughs> the important one there. I mean, we've all been constructed uh, by <laughs> by language, by culture, by, by others' memories. Um, and we're kind of given that. We're kind of not, I shouldn't say stuck with it, but we're given who we are by being constructed. And... Um, but I think the writer, I think as a writer, and I, from mo many, mo many writers I've talked to, what is interesting is how to uh, get in and slightly torque it or turn it so that it becomes uh, alive at, there in, in itself. It's not, it's not just in the past. And it's then, at least for me, when I start realizing that language, story, um, the imagination um, is what makes life possible. <laughs> you know, if if you can imagine it, it's possible. It's you can it can happen. So, Joe, did you? Uh, uh, well, there was some bit uh, that you said that uh, I have been to this idea of uh, uh, like I do find that if I if I use a conversation or something like that in formal work, then it becomes fixed. It becomes a stronger, a more real reality or a more memorable. Uh, I was thinking about that earlier today, and it's kind of um, almost like, I guess, it's like when you make a song, when you make a song, it comes to mind here. You know, there's some way that. Anyways, I was curious about the whole uh, idea of the uh, of kind of jumping language, you know, maintaining culture while jumping language that, um, I guess in the introduction, uh, somebody told the, the librarian that, you know, maybe China's big and strong here, but China's big and strong here, which I thought was kind of easy. Would the aircraft please come to the sixth point and come back? Thank you. But I have noticed that, you know, in, in organized events, in featuring Chinese Canadian writers in Richmond, there's often, if not, not a strong turnout of first generation Chinese Canadian. So I'm just wondering how, I mean, that, you know, you know is my question for you? <laughs> I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in that, you know, how we maintain within families or in, in communities, how we maintain uh, attachment, moving from one language to another. Mm -hmm. There'll be, you know, a certain amount of bilingualism, but that won't always be there. That's kind of like a bridge or a door. Well, I look at, uh, you know, people um, more concretely, more concrete examples of that than myself are people like Rita Wong or, or Larissa, who, uh, who have literally kind of grown up in both languages and so they have a mother tongue, and then they have this other, and many, probably many of the UBC students have that here have that same experience. I don't have that. Uh, um, I never learned Chinese. It wasn't a good idea <laughs> in the 50s to, uh, at least in the small town, to learn Chinese, uh, to even be identified Chinese. So, but I think that, um, the, the kind of crossing over is important for generation, this whole notion of generations and the sense of, uh, uh, as, as Glenn says, of the, you know, <laughs> will our ancestors remember us? 
and placing ourselves in that, sen that sense of continuum that, um, so that we, I mean, I really do feel like I'm in, engaged in a negotiation with <laughs> uh, a past that is the future, that it's, there's a, that it's not this sort of period, periodic set thing that I can only know history as past, right? Uh, Easterine, history, Easterine is a verb. It's literally to find out for yourself. The Greek root of it is to find out for yourself. So um, I think that in, in, you know, in terms of writing and in terms of, uh, and you would know this from being a poet, that we find in the imagination, working at words, working at writing, that the imagination feeds us back, that we get back um, uh, well, I think we get back possibility. Um, I was uh, I was talking I was uh, doing poet laureate stuff in Ottawa uh, earlier this week, and uh, I was on a panel with uh, Nicole Bersard, a Quebec uh, writer, and uh, who's reading in Vancouver this week, by the way. Um, uh, anyway, Nicole was. We were talking about this whole question of the hopelessness. Of, I had mentioned, gee, the hopelessness of of, of contemporary poetry. <laughs> at uh, well, at, at Christmas time, I had a call from a CBC producer who wanted me to help him. Asked me if I could help him gather together some poems for his special Cross Canada New Year's Day show. And uh, I, well, I got really excited. I thought, oh, that's a great idea. Let's put some poetry on New Year's Day. And he's, I'd like them to be, you know, kind of hopeful, upbeat kinds of poems, New Year's Day, right? I said, I said, okay. And so I went away for a week and I looked, I went through all the anthologies and I started looking at all the poetry I thought worth sharing with the nation. And, um, whoo, <laughs> you, know, who, you know, who wants to hear uh, Phyllis Webb's uh, For Friends Who Have Considered Su Suicide or, or Robert Croce's uh, The Sad Phoenician, or Leonard Cohen's The Future. <laughs> Who wants to hear that on New Year's Day with a hangover? <laughs> or, or whatever. It's just, in other words, you know, poetry is really, uh, it's, and it's not all hopeless, but it's, 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 it, it really is kind of a downer. <laughs> it's very critical, it's very passionate, uh, and it's very, um, uh, cognizant of everything that's wrong in this world. <laughs> that's what it looks at. What right? It also has to do with the culture that has poetry stems from. Uh, dealing with, uh, say, dealing with uh, like British or sort of like European culture, you do get those pessimistic sort of undertones being expressed in the poem. But if you're dealing with my, like where I come from, my culture, which is Iranian, and not poets that are express love, joy, like Rumi, like all this, like Sagi, you know. And I read those poems, and they're totally the antithesis of, say, William Blake, or, well, not plus so much William Blake, other English poets. Well, well particularly yeah. William Blake. Yeah. But, you know, we, you know, we always, we really wanted Keats's beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that's all you need to know on earth, you know. We really want it to be true. And, why didn't that one work out? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I agree. It's, it's a very cultural thing, and it moves back and forth. And I really was addressing more contemporary Canadian poetry is what the producer had asked me to look at. And so I started thinking about that, that um, a lot of the young contemporary writers, poets I know, who write really interesting good poetry, it's very kind of uh, cynical, uh, sarcastic, um, um, Use, has to use irony a lot in order to in order to get along. But this to get back to that story about Nicole Bersard, and I was saying this at this on this panelized with this, and, and Nicole said, um, "Oh, but there's the imagination, <laughs> and unless you you know, the imagination is what gives you hope, because if you can imagine something, that's where our world comes from." You know, we imagine our world. We make a world by imagining it. So, um, 
I felt a little relieved at that. <laughs> this elder, uh, this, this woman who's been around for a while, had really, I think, got it uh, more right than I had uh, that way. So I think that's important in terms of this notion of you know, family, ancestry, the movement along, uh, you know, the just keep going type of thing uh, has to engage these. What I, you know, in, in terms of writing, <laughs> art, in terms of making something, has to engage the imagination. Any UBC students want to ask anything? I'm a student, but I, um, I'm teaching Diamond Girl right now. Oh, to, no. to <laughs> Three sets of first year students, and so lots of things have been raised. In fact, today we were just reading um, the Heinz 57 varieties section. Oh, right. <laughs> um, so I encourage them to come out, but I know they're very busy in the school term right now, and the first year students still have to take some time. But um, uh, we were talking today about the circular nature of. Diamond Grill and the fact that everything is in the present tense, or most of it uh, seems to be written in the present tense. So just looking at the structure of the text itself. And I'm wondering, I don't want to say, am I getting it right? <laughs> but I, I, I'd like to know um, uh, what went on behind your decisions to uh, use language in the way that you did. I know from your acknowledgments, you talk about trying to uh, deal with the fear of the tyranny of prose, I think, something you mentioned. Um, and I know you're a poet, so it's, and it's very poetic, and, and yet it is, there, there's some prose elements too, and it, uh, it starts and begins in the same place almost. And I, I really got the feeling when I was looking at it, I felt like you had that collection of um, photos and in a folder, and he dropped the folder, and then we're collecting all of those photos, picking them back up and saying, oh, this is the one of Aunt Ethel. This is the one of, and, and telling us about it, just the way it was framed. So anyway, could you speak to that? <laughs> That's pretty close <laughs> to being right. No, I didn't have the photos. But I, um, it, uh, well, a number of things. I mean, I, the book started as a kind of a challenge from a fellow poet, B.P. Nickel in uh, the late 80s. Uh, he wanted, he challenged me to enter the three-day novel contest. We used to have a, well, I guess it's still going on, the three-day the three novel contest. Pulp Press used to run it, and uh, it's, the idea is, if it's, if, is it still going on? Yeah. You start Friday, uh, Labor Day weekend, you start Friday at midnight, and you go right through till Monday at midnight, and you try to write a novel. That's the three-day novel contest. And uh, uh, Beep had said, you know, well, you, you're, not, you're not really a writer unless you try all these different forms. And uh, I, was, I, I hate prose. I, I mean, or, no, I shouldn't say I hate prose. I love prose, but I hated it then. And I couldn't, I can't stand to write sentences. They just, uh, they're so precluded. Oh, anyway, um, I sat down a lab, that a Labor Day weekend in 1988 and uh, mostly because I had hurt my back and I couldn't do anything else, but uh, thought, okay, well, I'll give this a shot. And I worked, I didn't work steadily for that weekend, but I ended up with about 60 pages, 60, 70 pages of basically family anecdotes, you know, little things. And uh, I had, and I didn't, it wasn't any good. I put it away in a drawer and didn't really pay much attention to it. And, uh, but actually, my, that, friend, that friend Nicole Broussard had also said at one point back in the 80s that she thought the anecdote was really a poor form. There had been a lot of uh, anecdotal poetry, particularly in prairie poetry in the 80s in Canada. And it was just like too much, she thought. Uh, this was poor. And I, I kind of agreed with her. There was a lot of bad anecdotal poetry, but um, I thought the anecdotes are really time-honored form. We all use anecdotes. I love gossip, you know, telling stories and uh, sharing little stories about the neighbors and about your family and about each other and so forth. 
And I wanted to kind of recuperate the anecdote for uh, that set of stories. So my only familiarity with prose is the prose poem. Or my, not my only familiarity, but the way I like to work with it is with the prose poem. So a lot of the pieces in the book are, uh, you know, they, they're cadential. They kind of end on a little pirouette, poetic pirouette, just because <coughs> I want the language to move that way. Um, but <coughs> I really had no idea how to organize this stuff. And that's one of the reasons why it sat in a box. But there were a few pieces I kept reading in the late 80s, early 90s, I'd go to readings and I'd read, you know, I'd read this one or two pieces, uh, trying to fob them off as prose poems. They didn't, people didn't know they weren't, you know, they were just poetry. So. And Aretha Van Herc, my colleague at the University of Calgary, who was a pretty, pretty good prose editor, she said, uh, you should, you should let, give me that box of stuff and let me have a look at it. Uh, that's, she said, there's something going on there. And so I gave it to Aretha. She had it for a month or so and then came back to me and said, There's, this is a book, this is a book. And I said, well, good for you. I don't know. I can't <coughs> see it. And she actually put it together. She organized it. She picked up, I threw the pages on the floor. She picked them up and uh, pretty much organized it. And a very fine editor and said, you know, there were a few holes in this. There's really, there's no narrative. There's no, it's not a, kind of steady narrative, as you know. So, but there were a few holes in terms of addressing issues like um, reverse racism or, you know, my own racism. Uh, we're, all, we're all racists <laughs> at heart in some way or another. And uh, trying to work at things like that. Um, so I wrote, wrote a few pieces at her request. I don't know if that answers your... Yeah, I <coughs> the language then speaks for... So, I mean, I've talked about the fact that it starts and ends in the same place as a circular vision of history in which uh, a generation begets a generation, begets another generation, uh, this kind of um, past, future uh, that you're talking about, and the present tense in the same way, that it's, it's not that there's an ending, it's not linear, it's, it, it keeps going, and we keep going. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's part of my grandmother and me, and, and you know, if I had children, there's part of me and my children, etc. Uh, so we all keep going in this, in this a generational way. And I feel like the structure actually really uh, reflects that, uh, which is interesting because it's something that uh, you said you're quite passionate about. So, yeah, I don't feel it's, uh, as I said, that it, the Diamond Grill itself is, uh, it's like the third part of a three-part poem. It's sort of... That's how I, be, you know, breathing my name with a sigh, waiting for Saskatchewan, and that's kind of, we're a 20-year writing project. Um, I don't know that it's over yet. I keep writing about doors. I keep being interested in who I am, <laughs> selfishly. <laughs> yes? I went to UC so long ago, I wish we had stuff like that to read instead of Albert back in 1970. But, oh, uh, well, okay. <laughs> anyway, things have changed, but in your six plus decades of life, mm -hmm. are you now, because I guess you found some answers or you've made some of these, I hope you have, about the things that were wrong in the past, are you proud of your dual ancestry or heritage today? How do you feel about it now? Proud of it? We have our family reunion every year with, uh, you know, one Friday night we'll have a, an Italian banquet and Saturday night we'll have a Chinese banquet. So it's like, you've made peace with some of the things that you've been delving into. I don't know that one ever, uh, in, in a sense, I'm not quite sure what you mean by making peace. I mean, there were... Well, you're not angry. 
Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. Then you haven't made peace. Uh, no, I think I'm just an angry person. <laughs> I, 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 well, my I don't have to answer that. I don't know you as a human being or as a professor. I know you just as a writer. My grandkids gave me a ball cap of grumpy. They went to Disneyland and got me a grumpy ball cap. So yeah, no, I. Uh, it's moved so fast, and um, and these young people, uh, you know, being being here in Vancouver and. Being, I live in Strathcona. I, I, you know, I walk through Chinatown every day. I love, I love being where I am, in terms of uh, being with the pe being, walking through that area and being around that, those people, the, the people who live there. Uh, although it's pretty getting pretty mixed up too, but um, I'm, I'm happy with that. I feels it feels quite comfortable. And I'm so admirable. I, I so admire uh, the, ge the generation of students who uh, this started to happen to me when I was teaching at the University of Calgary. And the first year I taught there in 1989, there was one Chinese person in my class of 40 students, and that person was from China. By the time I left, 15 years later, most of my classes were about 30 percent. Chinese Canadian, and I, you know, and at UBC, I've, <laughs> I've gone and done talks at UBC where <laughs> it's probably more than that. But um, and just hearing, hearing, uh, hearing these kids speak Mandarin or Cantonese, uh, um, you know, growing up, being interested in their language, being interested in their. Uh, uh, their Chineseness, if you like, is, I think that's great. But I also, am, I'm also very, I'm also, I also love walking down the street and seeing, you know, uh, a white guy and a Chinese girlfriend and their little kid and, you know, I love that too. I love the, that sense of, uh, of mixedness. I think that's, I think for me that's important. <laughs> Is the new star still a trail? Is it trail or Nelson? No, it's Nelson. When did it disappear? Another It disappeared uh, in the in the early fifties. Uh, actually, it never disappeared as a restaurant. It always just changed names. Changed names. Changed names. So the building is still there. It actually burnt down two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Greek restaurant. <laughs> Does anybody like you say you have children or grandchildren or something? Have any of them shown interest in your father's and grandfather's native language? Uh, Skipped you for reasons. No, they 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 grew up in, in you know in small town Nelson. As my kids did, my daughters did, and there was no there was no Chinese language school in Nelson that they could. I, they, may, they may have been interested. I don't know. Had they grown up in Vancouver, perhaps. Um, my grandchildren are in half of them are in California, half of them are North Vancouver. They're not. You know, they're studying French. <laughs> yeah. Um, on your I read in an interview, I think it might have been in Faking It Too, how you were saying that you found the self in using the second person, in during, especially through forms of address with your father in the, in the book, like say, you partly guess what you like this. So can you elaborate a little bit more on that? That came out of um, uh, actually the book, this book, Wait, Waiting for Saskatchewan, where I started writing, uh, or Breathe in My Name of the Sigh, where I actually started writing. Uh, not about my father, but talking to him. It was finally, I felt permitted a way to talk to him, and that was you, you know. So it was a direct address, and that still feels quite comfortable, you know, in the sense of um, uh, having a conversation with someone who, uh, you know, I felt very close to at the same time, could never get close to because he was always working. <laughs> um, Is it easier than to say you rather 
rather than I. I mean, like, I, I mean, you called Diamond Grill a biotext too, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like, is it your biotext or is it his biotext or is it kind of in between? Like, who are you trying? Which self are you trying to posit? Uh, I'd have to say myself. I mean, it's my I take responsibility for the for the bio in that text, um, and it's. I mean, I use the term biotext fairly, you know, fairly loosely. I think a lot of writing is biotextual. It's just, uh, but this is more sort of. I'm trying to focus on uh, some sense of identity, some sense of of person. It's a it's an investigatory uh, writing project. You know, trying to find ways to move through certain things and uh, while doing that uh, sort of riffing on language, riffing on ideas, images and um, I, you know it's hard to say like for myself that I've like I can't identify that for myself I've made something for myself that I've come out of the other come out the other end with something that I've made I mean I <laughs> I know it's there, <clears throat> but I also have uh, been very much part of uh, of the times, and I really, I really want to. I start out by saying the '70s was was a major time. There was a major turn of in ways that we could talk about uh, race and ethnicity. It <clears throat> it's language, and we're, we live in language, and the the, the ability to. Uh, find a language in which to live your life is a tough one, but everyone's doing it. You know, and, if, and uh, contrary to what some people think of writing, uh, writing is not a solitary activity. It involves community. It involves a bunch of other people who are like-minded, who are interested in your writing, and you're interested in theirs. That's what uh, I've always I've gotten most out of writing is the sense of of community, a sense of sharing. The movement in the 90s, writing through race, moving through with all kinds of other writers coming up, having people like Rita and Wayman who were students all of a sudden you know, take off and do wonderful work on their own. And um, I, I don't know, I think that, uh, I don't even know what I was talking about, just that. <laughs> Just that uh, your writing is not, uh, it, it's part of a whole uh, uh, kind of context that is on the move. And, uh, so the whole questions of intention, questions of singularity are, are I think, fairly uh, marginalized. Yeah. I get the sense that in your works you're kind of playing with this distinction between like truthfulness and like being true, especially like the, the like the truthfulness is sort of like being sort of like that just you like being true and being full of being like genuine to oneself. So with making it I'm wondering like what are you trying to do that are you trying to do like a play between truthfulness and being true or is it being more true or truthful? Like I just get the feeling that there's this difference between the two. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where how truth comes into faking it. Uh, Just because I have a sense of with faking it, you're trying to create a voice for yourself and like being true to yourself, like you know, trying to create something that feels more like yourself than what. Faking it is more of a process than um, a metaphysics. <laughs> um, it's, it, I get it, you know, let's say partly from music, blowing jazz trumpet, you know, you, you have to, in a sense, experience, you have to explore how to fake uh, something because that's what the whole improvise, improvisational push is. It's not predictable, in other words. Um, now, there's nothing ominous about something that's being faked. You just don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to trip up or the way it's going to go. And it's that sense of not knowing, that sense of mystery, that what Keats called negative capability, which is 
uh, I mean, he, he uses the term negative. He always talks about beauty and truth. <laughs> I know. But I, for me, the negative capability one is the one that was really worth keeping. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question about truth and truthfulness. I'm not trying to tell the truth. Uh, as Robert Duncan, the American poet, said, you tell the truth the way the words lie. <laughs> what about the notion of exposing <clears throat> how the process then unfolds in relating the anecdote about your father giving a speech to the Lions Club and makes it slip? Are you not, in fact, then revealing what goes behind the scenes, sort of what the, the strategy is in, in taking it? This, isn't that a kind of attempt to then say this is this is being authentic in some ways there's a kind of truth, right? You're not Oh yeah, talking. you believe me. Well, right? when you say that when you say that you're faking it, this is what faking it means. Uh, then are you faking it when you say you're faking it? There's a there's a fake inside of a fake inside of a fake. <laughs> I don't know, Glenn. <laughs> 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 That's for me to know and you to find out. <laughs> it's a process. Process. It's just, uh, it's just. Uh, I mean, it's it's a process that I, uh, I've discovered through most of my life, and I think many of us do discover that we have to, you know, we get up, we get dressed every morning, and we're faking it. <laughs> but faking it in terms of making art is really important. It's a, it's an important process. It's very much part of the improvisatory act. Uh, um, it comes to me specifically through music, but uh, talk to anyone in dance, for example, they all talk about the same thing. You know, you have to, the body has to learn how to, uh, you know, uh, create a kind of magic. Now you see it, now you don't. It's a, not magic, but it is a kind of um, deception, <laughs> in a way. Uh, and I hope words can do that, too. I love to play with words in the sense that they, uh, and find how they reveal uh, other words <laughs> that I didn't know was there. I didn't know were there. If, and if I had, you know, it's, it's that kind of writing where um, you don't know what the next syllable is going to give you. That's so exciting to me. And you know, to get I only get there because I'm faking it. I'm, you know, I say, hey, I'm going to write this sentence. You think this is a sentence? <laughs> Wait till you hit the end of it. <laughs> These are heavy questions. I, re I retired from university ten years ago. I don't. I don't know what hybridity studies is. is it? Well, what you write about kind of hybridity and mixed race, is it different now? And would you, if you were to writing about it today, how do you approach the, the subject of hybridity? Well, I'm still writing about it. And I, as I say, I approach it mostly with this whole dynamic of the door. But uh, I'm, and I don't know what, uh, other than talking with, uh, you know, Friends like Glenn Deere or Joanne Arnaud to, about their experience with being hybrid, and uh, that's my, that's the only information I get. I don't. I'm not reading. Sorry, I'm, I haven't been reading the academic journals. I haven't been keeping up. You'll have to tell me. <laughs> One. Well, I mean, the, a couple last year or two years ago, uh, it's actually when I met Joanne at Hapapalooza. I thought, you know, for 
a good part of the, uh, the, the last, I don't know, 10 years, of that, I thought, gee, well, this whole question of race and hybridity, no one's interested in that. They're not talking about it. Not, no one's doing anything. Most of my friends, you know, like that whole discourse, you know, Roy Meek, he's not, he doesn't want to talk about that. He wants to talk about, you know, I don't know, Bakhtin or Rancière or something, I don't know, just like that. All of a sudden, we get this call from these young people who say, hey, we're setting up this festival called Hapapalooza. It's about being mixed. You know? And uh, it was incredible. They, and I think they, they still have it. They had it last summer. It goes on, it's going on every year. And quite a crowd of young people, not just a few. There's a whole bunch of young people in, interested in uh, playing around with it, working with it. Uh, Jeff Chiba Stearns, a fine filmmaker, uh, JC um, background, has so done some, made some wonderful films on being Hapa. Um, there's uh, the whole the whole question of the whole notion of hybrid, hybridity and and how to how to work within it in terms of um, that younger generation seems to be very very popular south of the border. A lot of organizations that, uh, <coughs> and universities and that that are, you know, really kind of focused on that. It's, I don't know, it's, it's, to me it's something that I seem to have just uh, kind of gone through partway through my life. All of a sudden I was able to use language to think about it. And, but I think now it's something that's uh, certainly in Vancouver everywhere you know I don't know <clears throat> certainly my ch um, my children don't they're not concerned about it I mean they they know about it but that you know so what it's not a big deal <laughs> so maybe hybridity studies is just like so what it's, it's not <laughs> maybe it isn't is it a big deal do you think um, for me it is but why is it a big deal I think there's no matter how much Around. I think there's still stuff to be worked with. I think it's definitely an ever-changing, ever-evolving thing. I think it's discussed in the group. So, I mean, my, my first experience. I'm slightly older than the younger UBC generation, so maybe maybe that's why. Well, you have one of your uh, one of your professors in the English department, Larissa Lai, has given a lot of thought to a kind of uh, a, a little more. If you like um, fictional uh, cyborgian <laughs> uh, shift on this, and that's something that I think is perhaps. I mean, the world around us now is so mixed that, uh, particularly uh, uh, particularly in the Western world, of course, you still go to parts of the world where it isn't mixed, and where you know. Uh, I still go to China, and in China, it's just it's very, very problematic in some areas to be uh, at all not <laughs> this or that uh, in many parts of the world. But in at least in our part of the world, um, you know, being mixed is a is a really interesting and acceptable, easy thing. I don't think they're going to be. You're not you're not angry, are you? <laughs> yeah, anger seems to come along, be part of it, doesn't it? Dynamic tension. <laughs> Productive tension. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for coming out.